we were just talking a few minutes ago, Tracy, about having life goals in your in your life, uh, plans that you have, jobs that you want to do and achieve over your life, and how many of us have really fallen behind in doing simple things like you know I don't know learning how to drive and stuff, and. Um, Tracy, of course, had ticked all of the boxes and I was very impressed. She'd done it all by the age of 28. But another woman joins me on the line now and I suspect she's a box ticker as well. Uh, Maria Reardon, good morning to you. Oh, Evelyn, it's so great to talk to you. I just landed back in Ireland and thank you. Not at all. Maria Reardon, I'm so impressed by you. You've met Oprah. <laughs> I'm just back. I literally just got back off the plane, just landed at Dublin Airport within the past hour. And yes, I was in St. Louis, Missouri with Oprah Winfrey. And it's like, how did that happen? I've been putting that on my list, on my bucket list since I was a teenager. In fact, in November 2009, I wrote an article because that's when they announced that the Oprah Winfrey show was going to finish after... 25 years last year so I put it out even in 2009 that I wanted to meet her and uh well, here I am today talking to you. Well, I have to say that would have been or would be very much in my list. Now, for yourself, though, let's put Oprah aside for a minute. You uh, are somebody who really seems to spend your entire life just getting out there, aiming for your life kind of goals. And you're part of that world, the life class world and the tour that Oprah Winfrey is setting up. But how, you know, how would you describe your work and where you're at and the kind of the, the, your day to day business, I suppose? Yeah, I guess, Evelyn, I tend to come at everything in my life from a different perspective. I was that kid, you know, who would come home from school uh, at five and say to my mom and dad, you know, oh, I want to be an astronaut. I want to be Superman. Just these crazy, crazy ideas. So to be honest with you, I felt like a little bit of an alien when I was a kid because I didn't feel that many people understood me. But my parents just let me off and encouraged me whatever I wanted to do, that there was no limit. So I'm very grateful for that because I found school. You grew up in Limerick. Yeah, I grew up in Croke and County Limerick, and I found school really tough. I mean, you know, I'm the eldest of four kids and the other three geniuses at home, but I really struggled, Evelyn. I mean, you know, I'm, I, it's only recently I, I picked up the bravery to be able to say this. Do you think but the I, classroom, like that formal atmosphere in the class, didn't suit you and your personality and your mind? No, because I'm, um, I'm very auditory and very visual, so I'm a chatterbox, and... For me to learn, I need to speak out loud. I need to talk. I have the phone bill to prove it. And you have to shut up in class. And that's not how I learn. And I failed English in the Leaving Cert, Evelyn. And I was like, well, my Leaving Cert results that year in August, I thought my world had finished. But I just picked myself up and but said, hang on. For a second, here. Marie, uh, pause you there for a second. In Ireland at that time, your world had finished because we were all defined by our Leaving Cert results. So that must have been very frightening, actually. It was, it was, it was like my life had just finished before it had started when I was able to go to get a chance, so. kind of, yeah. And, you know, it was because of people who worked in 2FM gave me a chance, and uh, Nicky Mack, actually, um, gave me a chance, and I was able to study journalism and radio because of, who, because of a veteran in RTE, and it gave me a huge chance, and here I am today uh, back from Oprah Winfrey. So someone who saw potential in what I could do, because I started broadcasting at 13 years old and moved into TV at 14, became an award-winning filmmaker by 15, reported as a journalist for CNN at 20 years of age. So people gave me a chance when there was no reason for them to. They just saw something in me and they had some belief. And I always had that belief in myself that I don't have a degree, I don't have these educational qualifications, but I'll tell you one thing, Evelyn, I've been through the ringer in life and I know a lot about life. Going back, I'm just kind of had my jaws on the floor at that biography you just gave me. <laughs> at 13, you were broadcasting at 14 you were reporting all that and how from your bedroom how did you make those connections how did you oh, get wow. to do all this you, you just had a keyword there and you didn't even realize it bedroom can i tell you something i did from when i was a very young child please share your magic i had a purple i called it the purple room i had my lilac room at home and purple is a very um inspiring color now that the educational tell me around the world so kids you know if there's a lot of color in their life they can be very creative I had a wall every morning when I woke up and I looked at my wall across from my bed it was full of Olympians gold medal winners world champions astronauts I had a cousin who worked in NASA he used to post me posters of the shuttles signed by the astronauts so I had a wall of achievement from when I was a tiny kid and that's what I woke up to every morning thinking about and it's what I went to bed every night dreaming about. But the most what, successful but, people 
in the world. I get that, but you know, you were looking at these Olympians, age whatever, in your bedroom in Limerick. What was what was going to be your passport to this? Like, what was the achievement going to be for you? I mean, you, were you out doing sport, or you know, what was in your head? What was in my head was that when I was four and six, something profound happened in my family and in my life. Um, we lost two kids in my family. Um, my, my little cousin Deirdre died of leukemia when I was four. It had a massive impact on me because we were born two weeks apart and she was my twin, basically. And uh, two years later, her little brother died uh, in tragic circumstances involving uh, a teddy bear, and I won't even go there. Okay. But, um, they were so hugely four, traumatic experiences for a family. Uh, traumatic, sure. uh, yeah. for, for, for everyone Dreadful. in my entire family. And that hit me so hard. I actually remember saying to my mom, you know, I want people to remember them. And, you know, I've got a bit choky here, excuse me. But... I always wanted to do something so people would remember them, so I could give back and help. So that really was a driver. So little Deirdre was cared for, actually, like so many thousands and tens of thousands of Irish people go there every year looking for a miracle, to Lourdes down in France. So um, I said, right, when I grow up, I'm going to go to that hospital. So I volunteered in the hospital in Lourdes when I was 16, and I got a taste for it. So then when I was 22, I funded my own project to the Sons of Calcutta in India, and that's when I made the documentary and I got to, you know, spend time work with and interview Mother Teresa just before she died. And that was at 22. And I just thought, hang on here a second. I really got a taste for helping other people. And then I had to spend time with uh, Paul Newman um, in the Barristown gang camp, and he set up Newman's Own. So what he was doing, he was donating a percent of his salary or whatever he earned in the movies to helping other people. So that's what I started doing. Every book, excuse me, I, I deal with the dollar internationally because that's, that's how I work. No, no, we're very impressed. But every dollar I earn, because I, I deal in one currency, because, you know, I, I work with people across 150 countries. So I love the euro, but I have to work in dollar to keep it simple. A percentage of every buck I make goes into the stock market so that I can have enough money on my 50th birthday. I want to build a clinic in Ireland to help kids. Okay, Marie. So that's, that's the driver. That's what gets me up in the morning. And I've got to pause you there, because I want to find hours. out how to make lots of money in the stock exchange and also <laughs> the clinic and also about Oprah. I have so many questions for you. i got to take the news, but you are not to move. Okay. Stay rooted where you are. We want more. Thank you. Column Hay Show on 2FM with Abraka And we were also talking about life goals and how um, a Mail Online study reveals that many people are 19 years behind their life goals. And, you know, those simple jobs like, you know, moving out, learning to drive, buying your own house, setting up a pension, writing a will. How many, many of us have fallen behind or in our plans for that. And I have the queen of life goals on the line, Maria Reardon. Uh, she's an Irish woman who is making big stateside and uh, will be talking to her about her experience of dealing with Oprah, Queen Oprah, I adore Oprah. So we'll go back to Marie in a second. But also, of course, because it's Wednesday, we will be checking back in with the uh, columns smokers or the people who are no longer smokers in the programme. And we are also thinking about the fact that the other day, Madonna's daughter, Lourdes, was spotted having a secret cigarette. And we're sort of got us thinking that really there hasn't probably been a person in the country who hasn't, who didn't uh, puff in a cigarette and they were a teenager. So what we want to know is how do you stop your teens from starting or having that puff? Any tips? How did your parents stop you smoking? 1850-715-922. But let's go back to the queen of the life goals. I've decided she's going to be called. Maria, are you still with us? Oh, God, am I was. Evan, it's great to talk to you. Thanks a minute. Not at all. So, meanwhile, you were just before the news telling me how you make your money. <laughs> Would you like <laughs> okay. to? Okay, so your plan is you have a philanthropic view on life. You're trying to earn money and give money back. Exactly. So I have a charity wing, and it's called Marie O'Reardon Planeteers Philanthropy, and it won an honorary award in December in the Middle East at the Middle East Internet Awards because I have an African recycled iPhones project where I'm able to educate kids in Africa. Yeah, tell us how that works. Yeah, okay. So since 2006, I've been educating children in Africa and uh, I've also been kidding out schools with computers. So the latest development in this is iPhones because remember I said earlier that I was a kid chatterbox who couldn't talk in class. Mm -hmm. So children either learn because they're auditory, visual, kinesthetic, that means touch and feel. I'm also a premature baby, so I need to feel stuff and um, practical and you know they need to touch stuff so if they're auditory they can hear it on the iphone if they're visual they can see the screen if they're kinesthetic touchy feely they can feel the phone and if they're practical they need to be pushing the buttons so no matter how a child learns an iphone can help children in africa 
to be educated. So I'm really excited about this and I'm ramping that up. And there's actually um, a billionaire in the Middle East is uh, helping me to get it out there as well. So it's like, woohoo, happy days, bring it on. Because I find it extraordinary. I have small children and how even the baby just loves the iPhone. Like I've an app with baby faces and he happily will scroll through, you know, so I can see how it makes sense that that would work in the classroom as well. Yeah, so there's something interesting as well because my fiancé is an educationalist and uh, when I was in St. Louis, my uh, cousin Amy flew in from Denver to see me and she got into the show too. They were so good to give her VIP tickets as well. And um, she's also an educationalist at Denver University. She was telling me that her three-year-old son, uh, like, like, like you just said there, um, he now flicks a physical book the way he would flick an iPad or an iPhone. Isn't that interesting? They scroll everything. Uh, the babies do it to your face now. It's quite scary. But Marie, talk to me then about um, the intervening years, you know, before we got onto the Oprah show. I mean, you made that leap from working in Limerick, setting up your kind of journalistic, I suppose, experiences, yeah. you know, getting over and, and getting to interview Mother Teresa. What happened next then? Okay, I guess, do you know what? I, um, I've worked in, I, I've worked in particularly in radio, but I've worked across radio, television, newspapers, magazines for, for quite a while. The majority of the time was spent in, in, in radio, in fact, local radio around the country, um, which I loved, adored and cherished because I'm, I feel... And I hope and I trust that I'm a people person. I, I love people. I love connecting with people. Um, I'm also what they call, you'll be doing a Google on this, I'm an INFJ personality. Um, when the, the analytics were done on me, I've been told I'm an INFJ personality. Uh, what is an INF? That's what you're saying, an NUJ person there for minutes. No, I'm in that as well. But anyway, um, INFJ, we're, INFJ? We're, we're very intuitive. We really feel, we feel things deeply. We make great um, talk show presenters. Uh, we can touch an audience. You can speak, and people uh, follow you with their eyes. They they feel they feel they can trust you, uh, and because you do you do treat them like family. Um, it's interesting. We're one percent of the population. Can I mention another couple of INFJs? Oh, please do. Because we tend to attract each other. Uh, Gandhi, Mother Teresa, Oprah Winfrey are the most famous known INFJs in the world. It's That's interesting. a good list, Marie. Yeah, it's, it's you're up there with Gandhi, Mother <laughs> Teresa, and Oprah. I like it. <laughs> I'm not um, going to Google it in case I'm very disappointed and I find it I'm the complete opposite. But what's interesting is because we're so intuitive and we feel things so deeply, my fiancé is also an IFJ. Can you imagine how fantastic our relationship is? It's really amazing. Um, so that's really, really cool. You're but very what, in love. I like it. Very, very. <laughs> that's great. You're getting giggly. You're getting giggly now, Marie. Yeah, so, well, you know, I've been away from my partner for the past while. It's like, oh, you know. Oh, we're still me, keeping you me home. I miss, I miss people. I miss people. But, you know, at the end of the day, I really feel that I was on purpose. And I'll be honest with you. I mean, Evelyn, you know, you'll get the, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth here now. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll be very honest with you, and it took me a long time to be able to admit this, but the biggest person holding me back in my career was me. I, you know, I, I was, and I'll tell you, I, mean, I went through this process a number of years ago. I got into personal development when I was a teenager. I was afraid of success. I was afraid because I could see how big it was going to get, and it scared the life out of me. So when I just buckled up and got brave and said, right, I really need to put myself out here, because I'm an INFJ. I don't naturally do this whole broadcasting lark here now, Evelyn. This is well, huge it sounds now very me. natural to me, Marie. Well, well, you know, this, but those of you, well, I feel very comfortable doing it, but it takes an awful lot for me to put myself out there. And people say, oh, yeah, but you've done this and that and the other. They have no idea what it takes for me to put myself out there. But are you um, saying then that you had... You knew you had the energy to help other people, right? I knew. But I, I you were trying. To, you could see that if you pursued it, it could be something that would be massive, and as we said, would end up on Oprah's couch. And that just almost seemed daunting because you knew it would take a lot out of you. It scared the life out of me how big it could possibly be. I was, I was afraid of success. I was afraid of the amount of money I could earn. Um, and I had to go and get strategies and deal with that myself. And, you know, for me to go away and get qualified and get an MMCP qualification in the stock market and to be putting my money in the New York Stock Exchange and the Chicago Board of Options now was massive because it was like, oh, hang on here now, Irish girl who grew up on a farm in Crogan County, Limerick, who didn't do well in school and failed English and doesn't have a degree, is making money and has been only successful. I've never made a loss in the stock market. Thank God, touch wood today. Touching wood here right now. And um, it's, how, it's how you're educated. So I know how I learn now, Evelyn. I learn through hearing and seeing and being a chatterbox and asking those yeah, questions. Murray, I'm going to stop you there because I, I agree and I second the chatterbox and I speak as one. Um, but I'm a chatterbox too, but I ain't making money on the New York Stock Exchange. I mean, that's savvy business work. That's got nothing to do with chatting. How did you crack that? 
Okay, what, what I did was I invented a system. I'm very much into systems. It, it's how I work. So I invented a system where businesses can have exponential growth. And I was able to prove it with Fortune 500 companies that it works in five days once I work with them. In fact, I worked with a company actually in um, who operates in Ireland, Northern Ireland, and the UK in the past couple of weeks. And they were able to tell me that my system, which has 105 steps to it, actually worked for them within four days. Okay, so, so, I mean, so I, hang on a minute, just because, I mean, I'm not in Dragon's Den and The Apprentice, you know. Sure. Okay, so you get involved with a company, you look at how they work, and you work out strategies that they could do their job better. I rip, I, I, I'll be honest with you, Evan, I go in there, I, I tell them, right, I'm taking over here uh, yeah. for, for, for the next couple of weeks. Uh, give me free reign or don't work with me. So it's based on that, say, to or not. say it's Evan O'Rourke Enterprises, right? You yeah. then know that you've smartened up Evan O'Rourke Enterprises um, outfit and you then go and, and work, get involved in stock exchange with my stock because you know you're going to, yeah. you've done a good job. Exactly. Wow. I, I, I go into a business and I, I turn it upside down. I, I, I literally, I do everything, even from the lighting. There are people listening to your show right now, Evelyn, in companies across the country, in offices around the country, and also home offices in Ireland because a lot of people have become, you know, out of necessity, they've lost their jobs and they're doing businesses out of their bedrooms in this country right now. And I know that fact because I've been dealing of with these people. Is. I've been working with everything from Fortune 500 to countries who hire me to people who are sore traders and owning shops in Ireland. And it's been bloody tough over the past couple of years. But what I do is I go in and literally even the lighting, if someone in their business is working with fluorescent lighting, even in the room they're working in, their productivity is going to plummet. I've worked with some of the best educationalists and scientists in the world. But that's why Google, I suppose, then, taking what you're saying, have get such reputation for having such a lovely work environment, don't they? Yeah. Because they so go with the bean bags and the juices. Listen, let's talk about Oprah for one minute. Yeah. I love it. Oprah. How did you get to meet Oprah? This is interesting. I guess I put it out there, but again, system strategies, steps. She has just finished in America the Oprah's Life Class Season 1 show on her new network, which is Harpo Studios' own Oprah Winfrey Network. It's her home. She's the first, yeah, she's setting up this whole yeah. network, yeah, yeah, and that's why she so, left the TV show, yeah. Yeah, so she just finished Series 1, which was 25 episodes. I followed, I digested, I heard, I played back every single one. And I really resonated with Episode 16 on intuition, on going with your gut, on knowing it's going to happen, even though you don't know the how. And I, I just sent some feedback to the show, and uh, within in two days, they contacted me back uh, on email, and then they started ringing my mobile, and then they started interviewing me, and then they started asking for loads of photographs, and then I was invited over to... Now, hang on, do you know where all this was going? I mean, you're savvy, oh. you've been in the media game, you knew they yeah, were kind of I knew, I, knew, really... I knew from first contact, since I've worked in the media, I knew from first contact where this was going, and I knew because of my life experiences and what I had done already and achieved... Are we scared that... of where it was going, or...? Oh, not now. I used to be terrified, petrified. I'd, I'd, I'd like, like, hide and not hit send button on stuff. And now it's like, okay, bring it on. I'm 36 of years old. Of course age. Oprah's emailing me, that's what you're thinking. You know, and it's like, well, no, it wasn't like that. I, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I missed her first call on my mobile. <laughs> <laughs> that would be unusual. So, so I, I, I kept the voicemail, actually, yeah, but that was funny. Okay, I think so they got through. in touch with you, right? And what, yeah. what was the next step? They said, come on to our show. They, they just kept getting in touch. They said, okay, um, all right, oh, wow. They said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call you back in a couple of minutes. I need to speak to someone. And then they come back to me. And then uh, one of the producers interviewed me for 30 minutes. And she said, right, we're going into a meeting for 10 minutes with Oprah now about you, and I'll come back to you afterwards. And I was like, I was pacing that floor, Evelyn, you have no idea. Mm -hmm. I, was like, I was sweating buckets. Like an expectant father, I imagine. And they, well, forever. And they came back, uh, they came back maybe 20 minutes later, and they said, oh my God, you've lived an incredible life, blah, 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 blah. And I went, okay, whatever's gonna happen here, I don't know, but I'm bracing myself. And then they said, right, um, come on, can you come to America? And I went, yes. Do you want me now? Can I hop on a plane in the next two seconds? I will defeat time travel. I will be there. So, so yeah. So, so I ended up there, and it was it was incredible because Oprah's a Mississippi gal, and uh, in St. Louis, Missouri, it's just down the street. It's it's actually the city is in two states. One half of the city is in Missouri, and the other half is in Illinois, where her show is in Chicago, Illinois. So the Mississippi runs through St. Louis. So there's a massive following for her there. And you know, St. Louis is, is a beautiful, artistic, modern city, but it's got massive homelessness. 
Uh, and even, do you know, Evelyn, I'll be honest with you, I was there with Oprah in the Peabody Opera House. I mean, hang on, Marie, you see, you're saying these things. What I need from you as a yeah. fan, you walked into the room All right, here and we go. there she was. So right. You walk into the room and first you feel this energy, this presence, there's electricity in the room. And you hear the voice that you've been hearing <laughs> since you've been watching telly for how many decades. And it's the exact same voice, except it sounds better, it sounds clearer, her voice sounds even deeper. And she's wearing this magnificent, bright, yellow dress. That's and she's yeah. wearing these bling, bling, peach shoes that I tell you, Manolo or whatever these people do, you know, <laughs> I, I tell you, BT wouldn't get a look in now with the shoes she was wearing. She even had her own guy on standby every time they were doing a shot to cut away where her feet wouldn't be seen. She changed into comfy slippers. You're kidding me. And there was a guy, there's literally a guy who changes her shoes. She doesn't look at them. All she does is lift up her little foot. He changes her shoes. She lifts up the other foot. He changes her shoes. She oh is Cinderella. God. She has her own footman. She has her own foot, guys. She has How her own That is why oh, I now know I want to be a multi multi millionaire. I want well, to be able to wear bling shoes when I have to, but I want to be able to slip into me flats when I have to, oh, and right. I want a man so, to do it for me. Oprah became, <gasps> my new life first, Oprah became the world's first African American billionaire. Yeah. And it was because she led the way that there are now other black billionaires in the world, which is amazing. <laughs> Did you know, Evelyn? She's got her own private personal photographer who follows her literally who follows her around like a little doggy it's unbelievable because she's got over 10 million people on twitter oh evelyn did i tell you she featured my twitter page live no. and i've only my at marie O'Riordan twitter page only has like 6,800 followers or fans or whatever the thing is and yeah followers. my, my Six thousand's good it's more than me my, my Twitter thing was, was up on, on the screen, and I yeah I, got, they, I have pictures and, and all Fantastic. of that from the set and that kind of thing. But um, she also has, you see, around 7 million people on her Facebook fan page. So she is the savviest social media person I've ever okay. come across. Are you in the running out of time? What I need you to do is just tell me, as you sat there talking to her, what was going through your mind, and when will we see you in action? This is what was going through my head. Her physicality, I'm not talking about her signs, but she was larger than life. She was so comfortable in her own skin. The person who spoke on the air live with the cameras live was the exact same person who would speak to you when the cameras were off. So and bizarrely sitting there, you felt comfortable actually and familiar because it was the same kind of person you'd seen on TV. I felt part of her Oprah world family and she made me feel exceptionally excited to just be me be who I am and to live the best life going forward that I can. I'm looking forward to season two whenever they want to air that. I'll when you will know. we see you or have you any idea? Um, they are concentrating for the next six weeks on the live show that I was just at. And after that, they're going to start filming um, the series two of Oprah's Life Class. So your guess is as good as mine. Probably later on this year, early next year, but um, I'll keep you posted. Listen, good for you. Finally, can you, in kind of a very short way version, as you said, we start off today talking about life goals. I want your three top tips for people listening to achieve their life goals. Okay, I think the first thing is very, very important. Every morning and evening, you need to get into a space where you're actually thankful that you were able to wake up and you're able to live your life during the day. And okay, number one, thankful. Number two? Thankful, I would say set your goals. Write down what you want. you got to write it down. you got to say it. you got to talk and walk your life goals. I want to have to change my shoes. The, number three? The third thing is if you walk down the street in Ireland and you walk across a one-cent coin, you pick it up and you say thank you. Because if you don't appreciate a one-cent coin, you won't appreciate a million. Oh, good stuff, Marie. I love it. Listen, thanks a million for taking our call this morning. Welcome home. Thank you, Evelyn. Jeepers. Marie, you were weird in there. That was fairly interesting stuff. So, yes, Oprah has discovered her. And uh, let's take a little break while we, uh, while we just relish and let those lessons that Marie gave us sink in.